Hello, I'm Jonathan Pinkney, Senior Researcher for the Program on Nonviolent Action at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this event series on people power, peace, and democracy. In these events, we'll bring together academics and activists, peace builders and policy makers to discuss practical lessons learned from groundbreaking research at the intersection of nonviolent action, peace building, and political change. We'll talk about how mediation can transform nonviolent action movements, show the strategies grassroots movements has used to pressure warring parties to come to the negotiation table, and how action on the streets can carry those negotiations to a peaceful resolution. And we'll take a long-term look at how nonviolent action and inclusive dialogue and negotiation processes can help forge a long-term sustainable democracy that includes the voices of the most marginalized. We hope these conversations will inform and inspire you as together we seek to better understand and bring about a world where conflict and injustice can be resolved without violence. Thank you. Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for this event on mediation in nonviolent action campaigns. Uh, so in this conversation, we're going to be discussing some key findings from new research into the frequency of mediation, the identity of mediators, and the challenges faced by those mediators uh, in nonviolent action campaigns and movements. While mediation has been extensively studied in the context of armed conflict, it's less well understood uh, in the context of unarmed conflict despite the fact uh, that major nonviolent action campaigns are becoming an increasingly common and important means of political transformation around the world. Uh, so it's a really a central context in which mediation can often play a role. So to discuss this uh, topic, uh, we're very privileged to have two experts uh, working on a cutting edge research project in this area. Uh, first, we have Dr. Isak Svensson. Uh, Isak is professor at the Department of Peace and Conflict Research uh, at Uppsala University in Sweden uh, and is a globally recognized expert uh, on international mediation, religion and conflict, uh, and nonviolent conflicts. Uh, welcome, Isak. Thank you so much. And we also have with us today uh, Don van der Reisen. Uh, Don is a research assistant um, on the Mediation in Nonviolent Campaigns project uh, with Dr. Svensson uh, and has done a lot of the, uh, a lot of the on the ground research work uh, for, this, uh, for this project. Uh, welcome, Don, pleasure to have you here. Thanks very much, Jonathan. All right, uh, well, we'll start fairly uh, broad. Um, I'm curious to hear from both of you if you can just introduce us uh, to your research on nonviolent action and mediation. So our project starts from uh, the premise that we need to study mediation in, in nonviolent conflicts, that um, we think this is something that um, has not been studied so much before. Uh, and as you said in your introduction, there is a lot of work being done on mediation in armed conflict, but very little actually on mediation in uh, nonviolent campaigns. We try to approach this in a systematic way. So we have went about to try to collect data in nonviolent uprisings uh, to try to see where it occur and see whether we can compare it to where it does not occur to see the kind of um, uh, the development over time and to see the sort of the larger global trends. And there are basically three major questions that we want to get at. First of all, we want to understand why does it occur in some campaigns, but not others, and in some phases of a campaign and not other, and not other phases. Secondly, we want to understand the sort of di dynamics of mediation in nonviolent uh, uprisings and, and campaigns. How does it unfold? Uh, how do, uh, which type of mediators are involved? What do they do and so forth? And lastly, we want to understand the conditions for success. How come that some uh, mediation efforts are sort of successful in trying to, in, in getting the parties to some type of an agreement? Overall, this project is, is, is a sort of a way of combining two lines of research that has been strangely enough, I must say, have been very separated over the decades. So the idea that you can uh, mobilize for social change and, and confrontation, nonviolent confrontation, the kind of civil resistance literature has been very sort of separated from another strand of research, 
which have been looking on how you can resolve conflict through dialogues. Uh, and we are part, I see it as we are part of a larger tr sort of scholarly trend uh, that is very exciting right now, uh, that tries to merge these two different perspectives, the sort of the revolution and the resolution aspect of sort of approaches to, to social conflicts. And I think we can start to see some sort of interesting sort of uh, patterns and there is some interesting things flowing out of this research, but we are also very early in the research. We don't have any uh, sort of firm and, and conclusive answers, uh, but we think that this paved the way for some, that we can pose some very interesting research questions. Thanks, Isak. Uh, so you mentioned some of these uh, preliminary findings on the, the trends in mediation in nonviolent campaigns. Uh, so what have you found so far about the frequency of, of mediation in these, these unarmed conflicts? Is it common or uncommon and how is that changing over time? I think uh, the the data that we have is preliminary and should be taken with some some sort of interpreted with some caution. But I think it's fair to say, uh, as of yet, that that it does exist. Mediation is a is, is a phenomena that exists in in, in nonviolent uprisings and, and nonviolent campaigns. Uh, but it's. Um, it doesn't exist, exist in all nonviolent campaigns. It's a relatively rare event. We're talking about sort of uh, somewhere between sort of 20 to 30 percent of the cases that occur where, where this occurs. Uh, so it's less common, I would say, than in armed conflict. Uh, it, that's one of the findings that stands out to what we have done so far. That it's it does exist, but it's relatively it's more rare than in, in than in armed conflict on conflict. Uh, then we can see that it's uh, fairly stable over time. We don't see any dramatic shifts uh, over time. Uh, when we look at those conflicts that get uh, mediated, uh, there is some evidence, but we can we can discuss that, but there is some evidence of sort of the, that there is some shift in terms of types of mediators and who are the types that are mediating this. But Dan, maybe you want to come in on this point as well over the on the trends of, of mediation. Yeah, so uh, like Isaac said, it it remains a relatively rare uh, rare phenomenon um, mediation. Um, but what's what's interesting is that uh, what what we're doing here, uh, the current uh, research project, builds a little bit on um, research that Isaac has done before. Um, and so in our sample, preliminary sample that we have examined now, we see a slightly higher rate of, uh, of mediation than we saw before. So there was a 20, about a 20% before and we see 30% now. Um, so, so the question is uh, whether that holds up in the end, but it's safe to say that it, it is somewhere between those, those 20 and 30. Um, and yeah, we don't really have uh, enough data to be able to say what the change has been over time. Um, maybe uh, that uh, that will change uh, later on. Uh, but uh, but so far we can't really draw any uh, conclusive conclusions on that. Um, yeah, what's interesting in terms of uh, the the types of mediators that we see is that uh, you see international mediation being more common than uh, domestic mediation. Um, and that there's actually also quite a bit of overlap between the two. So of all the uh, mediated campaigns that we examined, 80% had at least one international mediator and 50% had at least one domestic mediator. Um, so yeah, we see in, in half of the mediated cases, there is only international mediation. Uh, and 30% of the cases examined, we saw there was both international mediation and domestic mediation. And there's only 20% where only domestic mediators were active. Um, so that's an interesting finding. Hmm. Interesting. 
So I'm curious about this, uh, this underlying sort of rarity that you mentioned, um, and I think maybe particularly a rarity relative to, to armed conflict where you mentioned mediation is, is more common. Uh, what do you think might be some of the reasons for that? Why, do, why are more mediators uh, participating in mediation in armed conflict uh, than they are in, in unarmed conflict? I think this is a super interesting question, and, and to be honest, I don't think we really understand exactly what is what is um, the explanation for that. We don't have any firm evidence of that, but we can speculate a bit and on on the sort of the reasons for it. Uh, and I think that the, there is a tendency. I mean, first of all, there is the 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 the, the norm of sovereignty, right? Mm. Which means that a lot of, of mediators would be hesitant to involved in sort of affairs of, of domestic uh, domestic affairs. Um, so they are generally more reluctant to engage in sort of intra-armed conflict than in interstate conflict. And they would be even more reluctant to engage when it's sort of non-violent uprisings in, in, uh, within countries. So that's a norm that sort of cuts against sort of uh, involvement from from sort of at least from external mediators, and then I think there is a there is it's also a a, a sort of a, a selection of, of mediators a selection process of mediation of mediators in terms that that they tend to focus on on those conflicts that are most risky and most costly, right, and they don't pay sufficient attention, I would say, to to sort of uh, conflict unless they have sort of risen to the stage of becoming violent. Mm -hmm. And this is not a new sort of insight. It's been around in in, in the literature on conflict prevention for a long time, right? mm -hmm. uh, that the international community needs to act early. Uh, it needs to act in social conflicts that are emerging, but that have not reached the trend of becoming violent. Uh, and I, I, I think we still see a lot of that happening, that the, the, the international community in, in particular is too late on the ball. It's waiting for too long to, to um, engage, uh, engage itself. Mm -hmm. uh, in some earlier work that we have done when we have studied the conditions under which um, mediation occur in nonviolent conflict, we can see that when once conflict become more um, met with higher levels of repression, uh, then the likelihood of uh, international involvement and mediation increases. Right. So, it, to some extent, there is a there is a, a dynamic that is occurring here, which is sort of the. the international community and potential mediators that are refraining from engaging, both because they don't want to sort of upset countries and governments with sort of uh, sovereignty norms, but also because they are sort of waiting a bit, uh, sort of not being attentive uh, enough. And they are waiting and uh, focusing on other more, what they see as more acute situations. Mm. Mm. So I'm curious to hear a little bit more about, you know, what uh, what a mediation process uh, in an unarmed conflict actually looks like. Um, so I would love to hear uh, either one of you describe sort of one of the cases of mediation uh, in a nonviolent conflict uh, that particularly stands out to you, or one that particularly caught your interest uh, as you've as you've done this research. Yeah. So I, th I think. Um mediation overall and generally follow through a, a particular process, uh, usually follow through a process. And we can see that happening also when we talk about mediation in nonviolent conflicts. So it's about finding a, a way to getting access to the parties, uh, getting in contact with the parties, and then finding a way to set up some form of dialogue between the parties either through uh, carrying messages between the parties, creating some type of meet room or space for meeting, uh, and then to try to wor work out uh, a process through which parties can raise their aspirations, try to identify their underlying interests, and on the basis of that, find new types of solutions or proposals for solutions, paving the way for some type of of compromise or some types of, of 
uh, deal between the parties. Uh, and an example for this could be uh, the, the non-violent uprising in Tunisia in 2011, uh, where the so-called quartet played an important role. The quartet was a, a combination of different civil society organizations uh, that uh, to some extent were part of the nonviolent uprising. So they were sort of insiders in this type of, of, of setting, but they were also civil society organizations that could reach out to the government side. So they had that type of access, they could access both sides. Uh, and, and they created a, 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 a channel for, or a, a basis for a discussion where different actors in the Tunisian society in the transition period could start to discuss how they could form and develop a sort of post, uh, post-revolutionary, uh, the post-revolutionary time. So when, when the, when the uh, dictatorship was sort of dictator was ousted, how could they form a more democratic setting? And th they had that wider sort of deliberative uh, communication and dialogue and worked out those kind of proposals and, and sort of ways of, of constitutional making processes in, in dialogue uh, that paved the way for, for a more stable outcome. And Tunisia, as, as we know, is one of the few examples in the Arab Spring that actually, actually was successful. Uh, and I think that was, I mean, that, that success, of course, can be explained by many different factors, uh, background factors and, and the role of outsiders or, outsiders or uh, uh, and other factors as well. But I think to, uh, it's, it's fair to say that to, to a large extent, it also depended on that there were these types of actors that could play the role of, of mediators, that mm -hmm. could maintain sort of this dialogue so that you could not only the, the movement not only mobilize for change but could also have some type of format to discuss how that changed the sort of uh, that aspiration for change could be transformed into real um, political transformations so that would had a long-term effect mm. thank you yeah no the i mean the the example of tunisia is a really great one I'm curious, I mean, thinking about a, a mediator like the quartet that was, you know, remarkably effective uh, in achieving its goals. I mean, what would you say is the the general profile of a, of a mediator in a nonviolent action campaign that is particularly effective? Like what makes an effective mediator? And how maybe is that is that similar to an effective mediator in a context of armed conflict? And, or maybe what are some of the differences? Well, I think one of the, um... There, there are many similarities. I think the, the, the notion of access is an important one uh, for all mediators and in all social conflicts, uh, that's a tricky issue. How do you get access to the parties? And there are relatively few that are actors that actually have an access to to one side that could, uh, and also could have that to the other. So be that kind of actor in the middle that could play out to, to both sides. Yeah. There is, of course, a particularity with nonviolent uprisings, and that is that the nonviolent uprisings are, if we compare them to armed uprisings, generally broader, right? Mm -hmm. They are usually broad civil coalition with many types of actors. Uh, and sometimes they are very well coordinated and, and sort of have, have a, a, a structure, but more often than not, more often they would have a, a, a more diverse kind of uh, organizational setup. Uh, and it's difficult to know who is actually representing their opposition, right? Sometimes you have mass demonstrations, but who is speaking for those mass demonstrations, right? So the question of valid spokespersons for the opposition is a very tricky one when it comes to a nonviolent uprising. That's it. Difficult question also when we talk about uh, mediation in civil wars, but even more so, I would say, when we talk about uh, nonviolent uprisings, where this is a, a key challenge. Mm. Uh, and also, especially when we talk about how they raise demands, but also once you reach a, a sort of the stage of making proposal, getting to a, some type of deal, it's difficult to get. Um, Nonviolent uprisings, sort of nonviolent campaigns, to sort of back down from 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 earlier stated um, 
aspirations because many of the organizations of mobilization campaign structures, right? They are raised and created in order to, to push for change and that's what they are good at. Uh, but they are less able, I would say, generally to sort of hone in on their demands and sort of stand back for maximalist uh, uh, aspirations and, and sort of agree to, to compromise solutions and so forth. And that I think is one, one key challenge in sort of understanding the di particular dynamics here. Mm -hmm. How can sort of mediation play a role in creating that more type of um, uh, uh, conciliatory approach, non-maximalist approach, and how can you pave the way for sort of mutually acceptable agreements between opposition and, and challenged regimes. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Uh, what lessons would you say your research has for activists who might be planning or participating in, in nonviolent action? What can they learn about how they should be thinking about the, the prospects of, of mediation? I think uh, our research is, is, is part of it, this broader trend of trying to think about how um, sort of uh, mobilizing for change, uh, uh, taking a sort of a confrontational approach can be combined with that sort of what I see as the other leg, uh, sort of the conflict resolution aspect. Um, and I think it's interesting uh, because it goes back to some of the original thinkers in this field. I think, I mean, if we start with Mahata, Mahatma Gandhi, he himself sort of was very clear on that sort of negotiation and dialogue was the starting point. Mm. You st always started with negotiations and dialogue. Then you launched a campaign on sort of nonviolent action with the, with the sort of end aspiration was also negotiation and dialogue with the other side, right? So dialogue and negotiation was the, the starting and the end point of the nonviolent action campaigns and was a sort of an integral part of this process of change. After Gandhi, uh, uh, when people sort of theorized of his experience, we saw sort of the, the conflict resolution field and the civil resistance field, both taking inspiration from Gandhi and, and other uh, activists and, and, and great uh, names in, 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 in the sort of social change tradition. Uh, but they sort of theorized these, these different sort of ideas of, of, of approaches to social conflict in sort of different ways, right? And those trends develop very differently. Uh, and that's why it's so exciting to see, I think, now, just in the very last years, we see now a return of, of sort of a, a conversation between scholars that are interested in civil resistance uh, and scholars that are interested in, uh, in, uh, um, in dialogue and, and mediation. But also we start to see a, a greater awareness among activists, I think, uh, and, and people that are involved in these campaigns for the need of, of sort of having a broader, more holistic approach to, to, to nonviolent conflicts. And this also goes back to, the, to your question that you had earlier around sort of why, why we see sort of difference in terms of mediators and different types of conflicts and why don't they sort of refrain from, from engagement in nonviolent conflicts. I think there has been a and uh, sort of an approach also in the international community to treat some particular conflicts as sort of conflict that you focus on, on, on to, to, that are sort of conflicts that you need to mediate and other conflicts where um, you should just take the role of supporting the opposition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that kind of sort of dichotomy between different types of conflicts is I think often problematic because you often need both, right? Uh, you need to support a democratic opposition and the democratic voices in social conflicts and armed conflict and nonviolent uprising. But you also need to find ways for creating space for, for dialogue. And here I think mediation can play a really critical role. Mm. Yeah, just to jump in there, um, I think we see this also in some of the some of the data that 
you know, even within the nonviolent campaigns, certain ones get picked by the international community as being very important ones. Um, so uh, there you see a very crowded field with um, many, many different international or regional actors being represented, often uh, sending multiple uh, high profile figures there to try to mediate. Um, whereas in other uh, other campaigns, you you don't see any mediation at all. Um, so so that's something that reflects maybe this broader uh, tendency to to want to mediate in particular conflicts that are seen as important and kind of other ones flying under the radar. Mm. That's a really, I mean, that's a really great point. I'd be curious uh, to hear from to hear from both of you. So, I imagine if we were to ask, you know, people who are involved in international mediation, they would say, well, you know, we focus on conflicts that are armed or ones that have had large amounts of violent repression because these are the ones that they really need our help right now, and it's urgent, and we have kind of limited capacity and attention. Um, but and so maybe it's not ideal, but it's just you know what we have to do. Um, how might you how might you respond to a mediator, an international mediator who might who, uh, who might express that? I think that's a fair point, and and I, we know that many mediators are on the, the sort of resource restraints and sort of restraints in terms of getting access in different ways. So I think that's a fair point. And I think, uh, we, but we still we need to. I think strive towards changing a development or, and being more proactive mm. because we know that uh, I mean I've been focusing studying mediation in armed conflict for many years now and I know that that is very very difficult and most most of the mediation efforts in armed conflicts fail uh, they fail because it it is so difficult once the conflict has become violent once you this sort of uh, especially when the opposition have taken up also armed uh, actions. So uh, I think it's very important to think about how to be proactive and, and be active in that phase when the, the when the social conflict has not escalated to the violent phase. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 um, so I think there is an argument that could be made for sort of trying uh, even more actively um, recognizing all those obstacles and limitations and constraints that are there, I think there is still some more room to, to think about how we can be, develop our sort of capacity to mediate in these types of conflict. And it's not only about sort of uh, mediating ourselves, sometimes it's about strengthening the local civil society capacity. And that's something that stands out from our research also, is that um, we see uh, not only external mediators, but what Don said before also, um, domestic mediators. Uh, these are called insiders mediators, sometimes insider partial mediators. These are mediators that are, uh, for instance, if we talk about um, some of the nonviolent uprisings in, in Latin America, uh, I mean, the democratic uprising against Pinochet, for instance, we could see the, the Catholic Church playing a critical role, right? Um, and the Archbishop of, of uh, Chile playing a very important role. Having access to both sides uh, and, and um, both the, the challenged regime and the nonviolent democratic uprising uh, opposition uh, uh, and, and could play a very important role in there. And I think we, we also see that in, in our data that uh, um, it's fairly common that we see domestic mediators um, trying to play a role, sometimes by themselves, sometimes in combination with international mediators. Uh, and I think building up the, the domestic capacity to um, handle, handle the conflict, I think, is one critical, a very important and critical aspect to be done. Mm. Thank you. So if uh, an international mediator or other sort of peace building organization is interested in adopting this more proactive mindset that you're describing, and you know, whether that means building domestic capacity or engaging in mediation themselves during a, a, an unarmed conflict, what are sort of 
are there things that they should look for uh, for conflicts that where that sort of proactive mindset will be most useful places where without some kind of intervention there might be an escalation into violence what are sort of the signs that uh, that international organizations should look for well, uh, we know from before that there are some s signs for sort of escalation uh, in in sort of in in previous research on civil resistance. We know that sort of the question of nonviolent discipline, and, and you yourself, Jonathan, is a, uh, is the, one of the leading experts on this. That that's a, a, a critical a critical. Um, a question, right, and also an indicator for larger escalations, right? When when opposition takes up, um, uh, sort of, are not that are not able to to maintain their own discipline, that creates risks for further escalation of the of the of the conflict. So that's a a, a risk sign, I would say, um, that where you have a, 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 a big challenge. Mm. Uh, another risk sign, I think, is the, sort of the domestic, the, the constituency of, of uprisings. So we know that from previous research that when you have broad coalition that cut across sort of existing social categories in the society, so if you have a, a fragmented society in terms of, in terms of ethnicity or religious belongings or uh, class belongings or what have you, uh, if you then have a nonviolent uprising that is able to cut across those cleavages, it's more likely that they will be successful. It's more likely that they will be able to to uh, provide a. a, a a basis for further consolidation of, of, of a democratic uh, sort of development over time. Whereas if you see a sort of nonviolent uprisings that sort of that uh, get um, sort of polarized in a sense, and, and Syria could be an example case in point here, with, which sort of in its early stage was a, a sort of a very multi-ethnic uh, uprising with, from all from all uh, sectors of the Syrian society, but large, uh, during the during the campaign, it become became much more sort of sectarian in a sense, um, drawing on particular on the, the the Sunni Muslim population majority in the country, uh, and you got a sort of polarization between different groups, uh, and that's also a risk sign. Uh, where, where you get a, 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 a problem in terms of sort of a risk for further escalation, uh, uh, a further sort of uh, risk that it, it will develop into a civil war. Or mm. Great, thank you so much. Well, my last question uh, for, for either of you would be, are there any sort of additional lessons learned uh, or, or points from your research that you think would be particularly important to emphasize for peace building practitioners or activists or policymakers who are interested in this uh, in this topic. Dan, would you like to come in here? Um, this is this is a sort of an uh, an early finding, um, but uh, what I've seen in a couple of cases is that uh, when there is a sort of a crowded field of international mediators coming in that uh, they, these um, mediation tends to be more successful if there is a coordination mm -hmm. um, between these different actors. So um, I would say that's trying to operate as a coalition and, um, you know, supporting each other's uh, efforts is, is very important. Uh, that's one takeaway, I would say. Yeah, I think that's an important takeaway. And, and another sort of fundamental uh, takeaway, I, I think, is sort of move away from a sort of either or um, mindset in terms of sort of should we think about these conflicts in terms of nonviolent uprisings where we should support the opposition uh, and, and just think about how they can that you can win in this type of situation or should we think about these types of situations as social conflict where we need to bridge between the two different parties uh, and think of ways of finding some type of sort of a solution where both sides could live with 
Uh, and I think we, we need to move away from that sort of treating conflicts as, as either the one or the other mm -hmm. and thinking more about how we can sort of strengthen democratic opposition um, forces and progressive forces in social conflict and those actors that are important of civil society actors in social conflict. And at the same time, how we can maintain sort of channels open for negotiation and dialogue and also being open for mediation uh, as a, one potential effective, often effective way to create those kind of uh, channels of communications. Wonderful. Well, I just want to say thank you once again uh, to, to both of you, to Isak and to Don for joining us uh, for this conversation uh, and for conducting this really uh, groundbreaking research. Uh, you can look for some of these findings to be published uh, in a forthcoming USIP special report. And right now, um, next up, uh, we'll be having a panel discussion uh, with, gra with grassroots activists uh, and international mediators uh, to talk through uh, some of uh, what these patterns and findings look like uh, on the ground. So stay with us. I'm joined now by an expert panel of mediation practitioners to speak to how some of the patterns identified in Dr. Svensson's research into mediation in nonviolent action campaigns work in practice. Uh, first, let me introduce our panel. Uh, our first panelist, uh, Tigani El Haag, is a researcher and consultant working in peace building and mediation in Sudan. He has extensive experience working as a mediator between armed groups and the government of Sudan, and during Sudan's 2018-2019 nonviolent revolution, worked closely with the leadership of professional associations, a youth parliament, and other groups involved in the mass uprising. Uh, welcome, Tigani. Uh, our second panelist, uh, Katia Papagiani, is Director for Policy and Mediation Support at HD. Uh, her work focuses on the design of peace processes and more specifically on national dialogues and constitution making processes. She supported peace processes in Liberia, Libya, Syria, Myanmar, Ukraine, the Philippines, and elsewhere, and has previously worked for the United Nations, the National Democratic Institute, and the Organi Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. She holds a doctorate in political science from Columbia University. Uh, welcome, Katya. And finally, our third panelist is uh, my colleague Juan Diaz Prins. He is, uh, Juan is a senior expert on mediation and dialogue here at the US Institute of Peace, where his work focuses on bridging the gap between theory and practice in mediation. He's previously worked for the Office of the International Mediator in Bosnia and Herzegovina and founded the Berlin Center for Integrative Mediation. And he holds a doctorate in international relations from the University of Kent. Welcome, Juan. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you for being with us and sharing your experiences and expertise to help us better understand the challenges and opportunities of mediation and nonviolent action movements. Uh, and I'd like to turn uh, first to Katya uh, for our conversation. So one trend uh, that has come out of Dr. Svensson's research is that mediation is uh, relatively rare in nonviolent movements uh, relative to its occurrence in armed conflict. Uh, having been involved in mediation in both cases, I'm curious as to your thoughts on why that might be. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for including me in this discussion. I'm very excited to participate and to listen also to the experiences and ideas of my fellow panelists. Um, I would like to say that, um, yes, it's correct that indeed mediation in uh, armed conflicts is a lot more um, common um, and uh, has been uh, a, a regular tool in the international toolbox, in the, in the national community's toolbox for the last 30 years. Uh, however, the mediation is more and more observed in the past um, two to five years also in situations of uh, mass protests, uh, political transitions that might not have escalated into armed conflict and situations of nonviolent uh, uh, movements. Um, the reason for the why the mediation was not as deployed or as, not, not as frequently deployed uh, beforehand um, probably had to do with the fact that the, the international community and practitioners conceived of mediation as a tool aimed to resolve armed um, conflict. There was, in, in a way, a conceptual limitation on how we utilize this tool. A second reason, obviously, uh, has to do with the many political sensitivities that I'm sure we're going to discuss as, as we go through our conversation today, uh, related to um, um, 
international actors, in, in some cases, contributing to the resolution of tensions that may have to do with nonviolent uh, movements, mass protests, political transitions. So these would be the two main reasons that I would bring. Mm. Thank you, Katja. Uh, Juan, I'm curious if you have any, any thoughts on this question of the relative rarity of mediation in, in nonviolent movements. Kimmy, I do. And Jonathan, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. And um, I find this topic to be uh, really interesting because it's coming at a time where mediation is on, at least in my opinion, on the precipice of changing, mm. right? For a very long time, mediation was very top down. International mediation was very much in the diplomatic hands. And the concept of adding civil society was already a little strange. And then to add on that another layer of, no, not even civil society, which meant elite NGO people, it's like, no, 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 go out to this decentralized mass of people and ask them to participate in what is actually an elite closed circle of people. And so back in the 90s, when I worked at the International Mediators Office, when we would say that we were going to meet with anyone that was not an established elite NGO, the question was, why? Mm -hmm. Because it had to do with power. And the way we conceived power was armed groups, as Katya just said. And so I found right now, we don't know where it's going, but there is a struggle in the mediation world to flip mediation and to make it not just bottom up, but to make it broadly inclusive, right? I, I, people think there's a there's a there is a, a, a contradiction between bottom up and top down. No, I think there's there are people trying to break open the doors of mediation and let other people in. And so I don't know where it's going, but I think that's a big a part of it. Wonderful, thanks, Juan. Uh, Tigani, I'm curious to to turn to you and hear your thoughts uh, on this coming from the coming from the the case of Sudan. Uh, now I know you've met, uh, you've worked both in this mediation with armed groups uh, and in this uh, you know more open uh, mediation environment where there are many different kinds of organizations that might need to be involved. Uh, so I'm curious to hear sort of your perspective and experience on the differences between mediation with an armed group and then mediation in this context of a a more sort of diffuse, broad, uh, nonviolent movement. Yeah, thank you, first of all, and uh, I'm very uh, happy, uh, very glad to be part of this uh, panel and discussion. Um, yes, absolutely, uh, mediation in the case of, uh, if you can talk it as a conf uh, conflict resolution between two different conflicting parties, it is very obvious and clear. There's two partners, uh, gov central government in this case, or uh, rebel groups or whatever, armed gr struggle groups and mediators. But in the case of uh, nonviolent, Yes, you can find, you can say there is a central government or control of government, totalitarian or whatever, dictatorship. And there are some kind of opposers in most cases. Uh, it will be in form of professionals, uh, trade unions, uh, civil societies, etc., etc., etc. And uh, the issue of mediation, mediation will put a very, a very logical question. Mediation will, will, is going to be between who? Between the government and who? Who on the other side of the table? Uh, okay, if you can develop the idea of uh, uh, you can develop the idea of uh, mediation itself and, uh, and and the topics that can be discussed. For in case of Sudan, the the, 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 the topics of discussion would be yes, uh, peaceful transit, uh, the transformation of power, uh, uh, democratic transformation, peaceful tra tra uh, democratic transformation, human rights issues. All these issues can be put on the table as agenda for this uh, discussion and mediation between two conflicting parties. But in non-violent movement, uh, who is going to be to represent this non-violent government on the other side? This is very important and one of the challenges issues in mediation between uh, government and uh, non-violent movement. Uh, thank, you. thank you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm curious to uh, to hear uh, from to hear from you. You know, how did you how did you think about going about that challenge? Uh, any insights on how to you know how to answer that question of who is going to be on the other side of the table? <laughs> this will take directly to the question of first of all, uh, and to identify who is in the other side of the table. Let us take the case of Sudan as an example. 
uh, in, in, in 2019, after the overthrow of the government, so many different uh, uh, political actors just came up on the scene. Associate professional associations, uh, civil societies, political actors, political parties, and uh, to make to, to to do this kind of mediation take place to take place. Uh, let us take uh, an example. Uh, AU sent would be to be to mediate between the army, the the the, 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 the central. At that time, there is no government. There is army between the army and the civil or between the civilian and military. Okay. Uh, if we assume that the military was part from the former part, former government and they are representing the central government. The mediation at that time, the mediation is between one concrete agenda in the side of the uh, in, in in the side of the military uh, or the army, and we have different opinions and different positions on the other side of the civilians. So the starting started with the body started first of all to unify all these different uh, civil societies in one table to bring them on one table and then start the process of mediation itself. Uh, I mean the context. Here the, the question of the context is very important. Therefore any mediation or any kind of mediation, first of all, they have to understand the context. Context that they are going to or to, to be part of mediation team. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Tigani. And I think this question of, of representation um, and identifying who should, you, who should you even be talking to is a really key challenge in this space. And Katya, I, I turn to you, and I'm curious to hear your your thoughts on you know someone who is uh, frequently coming from the coming from the outside to engage in mediation. How do you how have you or people at HD thought about going about this question of identifying who to speak to in these situations where one side is much more diffuse and diverse? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with what Tigani said, that it's the most important uh, asset for a mediator in this situation is to have a strong understanding of uh, the context. More than in any other situation, if you don't have that strong understanding, uh, you run a lot of risks and you, most importantly, you run the risk of actually doing harm instead of contributing to the, the resolution of the tensions. Um, and so I would say that um, our engagements in these situations, in these types of settings, I would categorize them rather in, in two baskets. Uh, one basket would be countries where we had been present for a long time and where we had local teams of national, uh, in what we call in the mediation field, inside the mediators, meaning nationals of those countries, who may have worked in uh, political parties, in parliaments, in trade unions, in civil societies in their countries. So we relied on the networks, and the advice of those colleagues on how to go about it. Uh, and then there is the other type of engagement where we might have been asked um, to assess whether there is a role for us in countries where we had not been present before, that were going through situations of mass protests or um, uh, uh, political transitions of one sort or the other. So in the first basket, the way that we would go about it would be uh, through a diverse set of tools that doesn't necessarily apply to all situations and might actually, some of those tools might be politically uh, unrealistic and not feasible, um, uh, while in other situations they might work uh, perfectly well. One of those uh, is public consultations. Uh, so when you know um, uh, the, when you feel comfortable that you have enough understanding of the situation of the actors, then you might, as, an, as a third party mediator, hold public consultations, but we did in some situations was hold them in different parts of the countries with different types of constituencies um, that we felt confident uh, were relevant for the conversation. Um, those consultations were used in order to introduce the concept of dialogue, 
Um, in our, first, to introduce the concept of dialogue, the concept of negotiation as a way of dealing with the issues that uh, the specific country was dealing with, but also as an opportunity to air the, the issues and to allow the participants in of those consultations to listen to each other. Um, and also understand that there is within the movement uh, diverse uh, opinions, diverse interest groups that are represented. A second tool that we have used is to um, um, hold what uh, probably takes place later on in the period of, of the in the lifespan of a, of a nonviolent movement, uh, but to hold national dialogues. Uh, those uh, those usually are, are relevant tools when actually some sort of understanding has already been achieved on what, the way forward. So they're not national dialogues are not relevant tools at the very early days when people are uh, pouring out on the streets, but they may be in some situations relevant tools a few months down the line when just the very basic agreement on how to move forward has been reached, but when everything else has not been agreed yet. And just I will say, I will mention a, a third tool, and there are many actually, and I'm sure Juan will have more ideas. Um, and the third is the social media analysis. Uh, through social media analysis, we have identified we were able to identify um, important influencers, uh, but also to identify the issues that were most discussed, especially when it comes to protests that were um, dominated and influenced heavily by youth. Mm -hmm. So those actors are usually were very, have been active on social media. And so um, having an analysis and an assessment of what it is that they're discussing, what groups are forming around what issues on social media was useful for us in order to then inform the other tools that I described, such as national dialogues and public consultations. Mm. I will leave it there. So I have maybe just one quick follow-up question before I'm curious to hear Juan's perspective on this as well. Uh, but so it strikes me that what you're describing is, you know, in order to gain that context, it's a very lengthy process uh, in a way, or could at least be a very, very lengthy process with uh, lots of sort of steps involved here. Uh, and yet sort of what we see in a number of these, uh, you know, kind of mass nonviolent movements uh, is, you know, very rapidly developing events. You know, when I think about sort of the, the, the uprising in Tunisia in 2010, 2011, where it was, you know, just a matter of weeks before the, uh, before President Ben Ali fled the country. Um, are there are there ways to sort of still be effectively uh, effectively assisting uh, with media like with mediation when kind of events are moving so quickly that there isn't sort of space for say a lengthy public consultation process? Very much so. And I think this is where the classic tools of mediation are very uh, relevant and applicable. Um, when you see, think about the classic tools of mediation, those are the tools of uh, um, messaging using um, back channels, discrete communications, confidential exchanges of positions, um, and uh, mm -hmm. often through shuttling uh, coming uh, to um, the beginnings of an agreement of how to move forward towards um, resolving a conflict or at least diffusing tensions. And in those early days of uh, very high tense moments that you just described, Jonathan, the classic tools of mediation are very relevant. We have found again in, in our experience that we can play that role in situations where we have been present. In situations where we or in situations where we have uh, colleagues in our in the general HD uh, family, so to speak, uh, who have a history of engagement through previous professional lives uh, in a particular country and a, and, a, and a history of relationships, because those uh, those types of interventions at those early tense moments require very um, a close relationships of trust with people who are in positions of power so that you can play a hopefully useful crisis management and tension diffusion role through these uh, tools of shuttling, back channeling, and developing confidence build building measures. So this happens actually a lot um, in HD engagements uh, in countries where we have had lengthy long-term uh, presence. Yeah. Mm. Wonderful, thank you, Katya. Uh, Juan, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, uh, maybe specifically on this question of 
identifying who even to speak to um, and uh, and other challenges that might arise in the, the unique context of a, of a nonviolent action movement. So one of the, I think one of the biggest mistakes we make as, as outside mediators is that we think that when we come, you know, it's all going to work very linear and very quickly, mm. right? So um, we have a we, we have this linear expectation. I assess, I meet the heads, I discuss with them, we come up with a solution, it will be implemented, and we will monitor and evaluate it, and we'll have success, right? And that's a very power mediator approach to, you know, very old-style, international, government-based diplomatic approach. I personally come from the perspective of more from a transformative perspective where I feel that my presence in the country is already going to have, have some effect. Mm. And so I'm just happy to meet people. And if they actually trust me and develop a relationship with, they might tell me who the right person is to meet. And I don't see that as a waste of my time because I believe that the top down process will get there as well. They'll come back and say, well, why didn't the other side do what we, they said they were going to do? And then they're going to try to find the power behind the power. So we're going to meet at the same place. And it's going to take us the same amount of time because it isn't our conflict, mm -hmm. right? And so we're working on almost like a virtual time kind of chaotic space. So I think that there are people genuinely who are working on avoiding genocide and and mass murder, and they definitely need to get the quickest route to that, who the power is. And, and I think that they're absolutely right in going to the top and then trying to go down. Uh, and then there are going to be people like me that go from the bottom and up. We're still going to meet more or less in the same place. Mm -hmm. Because there's a German expression that says everyone cooks with water, right? Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, we're all, we're all trying to help in some way. And in most of these countries, there is only a small group of people who are privileged enough to be able to not to have to choose between mediation and negotiation and food security, right? So I think for me, it's a process of getting to know them and sooner or later they will tell me who the right person is. And I'll just give you one very short example. When I was working in Kosovo and I wanted to work on the issue of integration between Serbs and Albanian in a community, and we were doing it through the gender uh, uh, lens and we were having a, a meeting of men and women in the community. And somehow I didn't feel that I had the right people at the table. And the names I was being given somehow didn't seem like the right names. And so finally, one lady said to me, well, if you go out 20 kilometers outside the village over near the mountain, there is this lady and she lives there and she will never come to this meeting. But if you visit her, she's gonna tell you if you have the right people at the table. And so I went to this lady, I had a cup of coffee with her, and she was like, no, 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 these are not the right people. Um, and she gave me a list of other people. And she said, these people, if you really want to make a difference in this community, these are the women that should be at the table, but they're overlooked for a whole series of structural issues that are going on. And, and I found that fascinating. You know, I don't think I could have gotten there quicker, but I definitely got to them just by listening to people tell me about other people. So there's the informal way and there's a formal way, and I don't think either one is right. It, it's just a question of, and I wanted to just put, put, put this out there, who the person, who you are, what your circumstances and what the issue is will determine who you speak to and at what level. And and I think it's, it's okay. We can all coexist in that space. Mm. That's great. Thank you, Juan. Uh, Tigani, I want to turn back to you with uh, another question about uh, Sudan. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what made the most sort of effective mediators during the, uh, during the nonviolent movement in Sudan. Were there sort of characteristics uh, of, those, of people that uh, worked particularly well uh, in mediating that conflict? Um, again, thank you. Just let me say, take you back a little bit, you know, to before uh, 2009, 2019. Uh, uh, and let us just have the idea of, uh, just go out a little bit from the idea of the classical mode of mediation. I mean by classical mode of mediation, uh, uh, the two, 
pada si In the case of the revolution, as I just put the question on the table, uh, who, the, 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 I mean, who's the third party that's able to mediate? Okay. But uh, it just came up into my mind, uh, mediation sometimes can take different forms. And we'll take an example. Uh, in, 2015, in 2015, uh, uh, Yusuf uh, and through two respectable men presented uh, an, a proposal to, to the government of Sudan uh, through Mr. Kemen uh, and Lemon. And at that time, uh, this proposal was, is they call it soft landing. And soft landing, the idea actually was to convince the government of Sudan for a, a peaceful democratic transformation through an interim, uh, uh, interim period. And uh, technically, if you, if you can see this kind of uh, uh, intervention by the gov uh, government of the US through USAID, uh, it was a just simple proposal to a government uh, to take uh, for ideas, to take it or to leave it. But uh, as I said before, technically, you can say it's not a mediation, but politically, it was a mediation. Mediation between the government of Sudan and a nonviolent uh, uh, a nonviolent movement from the other side, and it's unidentified. You cannot identify it. There are political parties, there are the civil societies, there are uh, ordinary civil. Now, such a form also developed in, during the time of the revolution. There's a lot of people that uh, demonstrated in the street, in the streets. Who took on the power? Uh, negotiation was between women. By the end of the day, uh, the, 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 the classical form of uh, negotiation, it was happening between a group of uh, civilians that said they claimed that they represented uh, the masses and the, the army. And this is a kind of, a typical kind of uh, 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 mediation, um, uh, a kind of uh, conflict resolution. And the mediator was uh, 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 the, the uh, African Union, okay? Now, the question is, the ultimate goal from the mediation at that time is just to, to prevent any escalation for uh, violence in Sudan and to go for an interim period and then to go for uh, a peaceful and safe tra democratic trans uh, transformation. Now, the case, if you are talking about, if you would like to, uh, to make this idea more applicable in the case now in the Sudan recently, there is, we have an, uh, a transitional government. How, if we would like to talk about mediation, how mediation, what, what the form of mediation ha should have to take be, uh, place in uh, Sudan and between who and who? Uh, uh, in my ideas, I think now, uh, let us talk about uh, the, uh, the, the mediation. It can take different forms of interventions from different international community and from civil societies and from, from different actors uh, by the end of the day, they are supportive for the, the, uh, the democratic transformation. I, I, from my side, I can call this is any intervention that helping in peaceful transformation, even if without taking place the classical shape of uh, transformation between different parties, actually, uh, in fact, it, they are supporting in uh, a, a, a successive, uh, successive kind of mediation. Uh, this is in my idea. Uh, because now, classically, we cannot identify two conflicting groups here in Sudan. Between who and who? Transitional government and who? Transitional government and the... Like, because of the, 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 such kind of mediation, I mean, we have um, simply... I'm, I'm thinking, let's... Like, I'm, I'm trying to think loudly. Let us rethink uh, uh, the strategies and tactics of uh, mediation uh, when dealing with the context of Sudan. Uh, especially now, not before, because previously it was clearly identified that there's a totalitarian government and there is some kind of process. A mediation has to take place between the two sides. Now, there is no any enemy on the other side. There's only a, 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 a transitional government. We need to take it to the other side to peacefully to, uh, trans, uh, to transform the government into a, a fully democratic system. So. A mediation here in this case and in this context should have to take another form and another shape and another tactics and another kind of 
let us say, mechanism, if we are going to deal with it as a mediation in the case of Sudan. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tigani. Um, I want to sort of go on something you said there about the need to rethink strategies and tactics of mediation uh, in this uh, in this particular kind of context. And uh, and Katya, I'll turn to you. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on you know what kinds of skills and training uh, have been most useful for mediators to you know increase their effectiveness in in doing this rethink of strategies and tactics uh, in the context. Uh, of of working with nonviolent action movements, uh, any any thoughts you might have on on that subject? Um, it's a, it's a difficult question, Jonathan, because um, the skills you need are um, the ones that, in a way, Tigani described very well. The skills uh, relate to capacity to interact with many different types of actors and stakeholders. You um, ideally would have the socio social and political and analytical skills to interact with um, senior political party representatives, army representatives, youth actors, civil society, the average person on the street, in order to do exactly what Juan described earlier, to smell and feel the situation and understand what networks are necessary in order to build um, uh, some sort of a dialogue process that will help the society or the community get out of the tension or the, the crisis. Um, and those skills are difficult to um, acquire because as we have been discussing in this session, mediation is not anymore about a table. It's not anymore about concrete parties. So um, you, in a way, in the 90s, it would have been simple to, to, to train and to educate uh, younger people or anyway, new entrants to the field because you could describe the concept of the negotiation table, the concept of the conflict party. But now, as the Tigani described, the whole society is engaged in these situations in the renegotiation of what the, the country should be. So. To answer your question, I think the skills should be ones of uh, conflict analysis that is inclusive, actor mapping that is inclusive. Uh, I I don't know actually if networking is something that whether networking is something that can be taught through training, mm -hmm. uh, but may clearly that that's one of the main skills. And actually, I think um, understanding the social media reality is key. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in all countries, but uh, if we're thinking about Southeast Asia uh, situations, um, that probably you can imagine which, which ones uh, we can be referring to. A lot of the debates and the discussions and the organizing take place on social media. And if you're not literate, at least to understand how people use these tools, um, you will not be effective in your work. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Katya. Um, Juan, any uh, any thought, any final thoughts uh, on sort of this question of skills and training for mediators to be more effective in working with movements? Uh, and I think after that, we will uh, we will wrap up. So I'd like to I'd like to just add two things. One is to what Tigani said and about needing a new form of mediation. So this is just my own personal understanding, right? Globalization and digitalization fragmented the world. And mediation will have to fragment with it, right? This idea that there is one mediator and that we should all wait to see if XXX mediator has achieved something in 18 months or 22 months or whatever, I, that's not the way the world works anymore. So it might be that you have multiple mediators working in multiple spaces one with armed groups, one with social groups, one with political leaders, right? Um, one with internationals who all want a piece of what's happening and that those mediators are going to have to learn to work together. And I'm going to be very honest, the vanity of mediators is very high. I am included in that. I'm not, I'm not pointing to anybody else, pointing to myself. We all want to, I call it the Jesus Christ uh, syndrome, right? Mm. We all think we're going to save it. Right, so um, I think we're going to have to learn that we also have to be inclusive <laughs> in our mediation efforts. I'd like to also add, and you're going to probably think, oh my God, here comes the transformative person. I want to add to uh, everything that Tanya said, I agree 100%. But I believe you need to have the skill of being able to put together a team 
and realize that you can't do everything yourself and you got to really trust your team and let them shine and do what they need to do. So you really do have to have that kind of, I have seen mediators fail because they don't have organizational skills. Mm -hmm. And number two and three, I'm not, I feel terrible because I feel like I'm getting it very stereotypical. The mediator really has to have empathy and the ability to understand that they are a trust building mechanism. So parties do not trust mediators because they're appointed by the UN or the EU or the Americans or the Europeans. You have to build trust. And if you don't know how to do that, right? If you don't understand the basic building blocks of trust building and empathy, you will never be believed enough to make those hard concessions that the parties will inevitably have to make. They will do it for people they trust. Mm. They will say, okay, Katya, because it's you, and if you promise me I'm not going to be hurt by this, I will believe you, Katya. And that, that personal moment between a mediator and the parties doesn't disappear even in the grandest mediations. And I think if we can teach them organizational skills, trust building and empathy, all the other stuff comes with, you know, the proper classical conflict management training that all of us get when we're studying. And there, there are enough people out there. Right? Great. Thank you so much, Juan. Uh, and thanks to all of you for, for joining us today. We'll wrap up our, our discussion there. Um, I'm so grateful to all of you for, for joining us and discussing this important topic, and also to Dr. Isak Svensson uh, and Don Vanderizen for uh, to conducting this new research. Uh, you can look for the publication of their research results uh, in a forthcoming USIP special report in the coming months. I hope this, discuss this discussion has been informative and helpful for all of you joining us as we dig into these crucial connections between nonviolent action and peace building. Uh, make sure to join us for our next event uh, in our People Power, Peace and Democracy event series uh, in the coming weeks, where we'll be discussing new research on how nonviolent action campaigns can impact peace processes in civil wars. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan.